Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our book launch this evening. Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you tonight as we launch Lisa Kelly's second collection, um, The House of the Interpreter. Uh, it's a Poetry Book Society recommendation this summer, um, and I'm really, really excited that Lisa's going to read for us from it. Um, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Car Connect, and I'm just going to run over what's going to happen tonight. Um, Lisa Kelly is here as well. Now, I can see that you found the chat box. Uh, please do find that. Make sure you use the, the option that says everyone so we can all read each other's messages. Um, say hello, let us know where you're watching from, let us know what you think of the reading. Uh, later on in the event, there will also be the option to send questions in for Jason to put to Lisa. So please find another button which says Q&A on it. If you can get your questions lined up for Lisa, then um, she'll be able to answer them later on in the event. So I think that's um, most of the important info out of the way. As I said, I'm very pleased that we're joined by Jason Allen Pazon. He's also a car connect poet. His uh, second collection, Self Portrait as a, as a Fellow, Self Portrait as a Fellow, was published in March. Um, I'll put that link in the chat for you there um, and I'm very very pleased to join welcome him on screen to join us uh, so we can begin. I'm now unmuted I'll say that again hello everyone and good evening to you it is a joy to be here to celebrate Lisa's second collection uh, the house of the interpreter and to launch into, into the world thanks to Jasmine for uh, welcoming us um all already um i i'm going to be doing a, a fuller introduction of 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 lisa and her work before inviting her to read so lisa kelly is a poet and editor she has published several pamphlets and her first collection of poems a map towards fluency 2019, also published by Karkinet, was shortlisted for the Michael Murphy, Michael Murphy Memorial uh, Poetry Prize in 2021. She's co-chair of Magma Poetry and a regular host of Poetry Evenings at the Toriano Meeting House in London. Her poems have been selected for anthologies, including Stairs and Whispers, Deaf and Disabled Poets Right Back, published by Nine Arches Press, and the Forward Book of Poetry. In 2021, Lisa co-edited What Meets the Eye, an anthology of poetry and short fiction by UK deaf and hard of hearing, deaf and hard of hearing writers for Arachnid Press. She teaches poetry and performance and is a freelance technology journalist. To escape noise, she walks and looks out for among, among other things, fungi. You may have come across some of these in the book we're launching this evening. One of the things I found interesting about Lisa is her study of British Sign Language, something that's been very important to her and to the work she does. She's been studying British Sign Language, BSL, for several years and has a signature level, level six qualification in it. Lisa herself has single-sided deafness. She is half Danish, and I dare say this plurality, uh, cultural linguistic plurality is something that informs her work. The word that came to my mind upon first reading the House of the Interpreter was cellular. To say that in the most, in that, that in the most striking poems, there was something cellular about the language was my way of saying that the poems, it seemed to me, wanted to transcend our version of articulacy, our version of what it is to have speech somewhat uh, uh, um, presumptuous, it might be to say our, um, but shall we say mainstream human-centric human uh, notions of what it is to have speech. At least that's where they led me. In poems like Blackbird as Beethoven or 
Michelangelo learning BSL linguistics with flashcards on the treadmill, I like the title. I experienced the body as an ecology and language as a felt thing above all else. Of the house of the interpreter, Ilya Kaminsky writes, quote, first thing I love about Lisa Kelly's work is her incredible imagination. She tells the truth about oralism, discrimination, injustice, but tells it in a way that's so lyrical, it's instantly memorable, which is to say, Kelly invents her own style. The second thing I love about the House of the Interpreter is that this manifesto for deaf, deaf culture, shimmering with music and lyric abandon is unafraid of discovery, end quote. I'm thrilled to be here uh, leading this event and in conversation with Lisa. And I know that you're very keen to hear her read. So I'm going to turn over to her now. Lisa Kelly. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you so much, Jason, for that really incredible introduction. That was amazing. Um, I have a lot of debt of thanks. I really want to thank, first of all, Michael Schmidt for believing in the project. When I first was thinking about whether I could write a collection that linked um, my deafness, my experience of deafness, learning British Sign Language with fungi. Um, I thought maybe it was a little bit of a, a, um, a stretch, shall we say, but Michael immediately warmed the idea and I'm very grateful also to the Society of Authors for giving me a grant um, to be able to have the space to, to write the collection. Um, I also want to say a massive thanks to Jasmine Linklater, who really helped me shape the collection. It's so important. I know many of the people watching are poets, but when you're putting a collection together, it's what do you include? What do you leave out? And I, I'm, I tend to be a little bit on the bloated side, shall we say. So Jazz was very strict with me in saying, I think your collection wants to be this. And and she was asking me what I wanted it to be. And I was, and when she asked me, it came to me. I hadn't really thought about it too closely before, but I, I wanted it to be political um, at its heart. So thank you to, to Jazz, Jasmine for really guiding me on that. Um, and also to John McAuliffe, who really helped with polishing and reordering some of the poems that just gave it that little extra, you know, thing. Um, I also am really happy that Caroline Palmer is in the audience. She is one of my fantastic BSL teachers who um, is incredible. And every Friday we meet online, a group of us, and it's really, really important to, to my sign language and to my continuing progress in sign language, because like any language, you have to practice it. And I'm not very good at languages. I, I freely admit it. I always struggled at school with French and German and Danish. I failed to learn Danish, even though my mum was Danish. Um, so actually, I feel quite triumphant that I have got somewhere with British Sign Language. It's, it's um, a source of joy for me. Um, and also all the deaf creatives who really have... Um, made a massive impact either through collaborations or through reading their work, Ilya Kaminsky, Raymond Antrobus, who I worked with on the deaf issue of Magma many, many years ago, which really was the beginning of a learning sign language for me. Sophie Stone, who I co-edited What Meets the Eye with. Um, um, Arachne Press, uh, Cherry Potts for publishing that, that collection as well. There are so many, Josephine Dickinson, um, there are so many who, you know, you look them up, that Nadia Nadaraja, uh, Zoe McWinney, there are fantastic poets out there who are really sort of bringing sign language and poetry in different ways of communication beyond oralism to the fore. I think that I probably done enough, thank you. So I'm going to um, get on with reading the, the poems now and um, thank you so much for, for listening and for watching Lisa Lee as well, thank you. So my first poem deals with some of the things I mentioned in my introduction in that I am half Danish, but my mother did not uh, bring 
me and uh, um, my three siblings up speaking Danish and uh, for, for various reasons, I think she really wanted to just sort of fit in with her, her, her husbands and not have them feel excluded. But it was, it's a great loss not hearing her voice anymore. And as I said, I've struggled to, to learn Danish, but failed. But I've got the Danish word yen, which means home. Um, and just a couple of signs as well. Um, home and tent. And in Danish sign language, home. Sign language of home. Fingers are not fluent in this tips to tips roof, as if hands in prayer have been prized apart, leaving finger pads to take fingerprints. A tentative tent, but this temporary refuge is signed by a sharp angled collapse, allowing unfamiliar air and absence to intervene. What of my Danish yem? Not at home, on my tongue or in my hands. A basic beginning in types for makes my right hand dive for shelter under the welcoming curve of my left, fingers finding freedom, venturing for air, only when they feel the warmth of flesh. Is this what it is like for us all, always having to relearn home with a strange tongue and alien hands prepared to open our mouths as if to beg, to touch tongue tip with fingertip to reveal ourselves? This tongue, signs almost the same in my native sign. This tongue sounds almost the same in my estranged mother tongue. If it does not fall on my deaf ear, if we can look to a gesture of home. So this next poem, I had a commission during lockdown from Nottingham Trent University, and I was looking at um, Alexandra Graham Bell, who has a very checkered history within the deaf community. Um, he voted in the Milan conference in 1880 for a complete ban on sign language. But of course, many of you will know him for inventing the telephone. Um, I also then came across this fantastic Victorian ear trumpet, this huge ear trumpet um, used as the title says during a period of mourning in Europe, 1850 to 1910. And I think reflecting the Victorian attitude to ritual, to mourning, um, and that was the inspiration for this poem, which is really two dramatic monologues um, from the point of view of oppression of sign language, the husband in the first uh, stanza and oralism and in the second stanza, what I imagine the wife might feel like if she was allowed to sign. One, in life she listened to me, or at least tried. Out of kindness, I raised my voice to make her understand. Now I have died, my dumb widow must mourn. My choice of ear trumpet will be held to her deaf ear with its ornate black lace collar and bow. I warned on my deathbed. Nothing to fear if you occupy your hand with this gift I bestow. She paled when I raised the spectre of the workhouse, reminded the sweet simpleton of the Institute for the Deaf. Speech is a divine spark. My mute grey mouse must listen for the ghost of her better half. Two. Today, I stand naked as a sylph dressed in air. He is under the ground and I float above his grave. I frolic in front of a glass with the trumpet to my ear. Its black lace bow looks dandy, this I will save, rip it from its hard shaft and pin it to my curls. The black lace collar will be food for the moths. Look now at this denuded amplifying cone, its bare shell. Let me fill it with cream to spill on morning cloth or plant it in the heap of fresh earth that covers his bones. 
cut a single white trumpet flower to place in its O. It will bind him to his voice as the north wind groans. My hands are free to sign in their natural flow. So when I was growing up, like many teenagers, I suffered from insecurities and um, I tried to disguise the fact that I was half deaf by making sure that people were on my hearing ear and not, not really mentioning it. So people often thought I was stupid or rude or whatever they thought. Um, and, and this experience is one that I remember hating um, call it deaf shame. From Deaf Diaries, Tuesday afternoon, thinking of getting a haircut, 12th of February, 2019. I remember trying to lip read my hairdresser's small talk, looking in the mirror while the hairdryer blew hot air into my hearing ear as he styled the right side of my head. I remember looking at my teenage face and watching it grow redder and redder as I nodded and smiled at what I hoped were the right cues. So as I've been talking about my journey in learning British Sign Language, it's now um, a source of pride for me, my deafness. It's led me on a fantastic journey of discovery. And one of the things I love about British Sign Language is the hand shapes and how in English you have puns um, and wordplay based on sound, but in uh, British Sign Language, you have um, poetry, which plays with the idea of similar hand shapes. And I will do a little bit of signing with this. I mean, Lisa will do a much better job than me, but just to sort of help you understand my thinking um, with some of those hand shapes. Call an airborne loved one. My right fist is a handset. My thumb, the earpiece. Little finger, the mouthpiece. Now my fist is horizontal. Finger and thumb are the wings of a plane coming in to land at the airport of my open left palm. Thumb wing tilted on Mount of Venus. Do the ears of the imaginary people pop? Have they turned on their phones? Yes or no? Which? My horizontal fist and indicative digits shape from side to side. The calloused airstrip falls away. Passengers of this ham-fisted pilot suffer turbulence. They need a restorative glass of wine, tip, thumb, flute, and little finger stem to lips to ferment the flow of flesh before the back of my fist is stuck to my forehead with hex finger and little finger thorns. This is how the devil looks, jealous of all things that fly and land safely. Think of sound waves traveling at the speed of love. Maybe my fist vibrates, little finger and thumb cocked. It is time to make that call. My right fist is a handset my thumb the earpiece, little finger the mouthpiece. I think of all the calls that were never heard. I was very interested in um, reading about the Inuit creation myth and the goddess of the sea, Sedna, and this poem I wrote during a time when I was working as a communication support worker in a supermarket in North London. Um, it was a difficult time for me in deciding my right to be there, being half hearing, but I did make sure all the, 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 the customers were this side of me on my hearing side. Um, so I was able to give that, that support and, and do, the, do the interpreting, which is, that was my job, that was why I was there. But um, one of the things you, you realize when you're working with the general public is the sort of the, the characters and the range of opinions, beliefs, um, prejudices that they have. And, and this one 
woman came in during uh, um, lockdown and she, well, I was on the uh, lottery and cigarette counter and she kept buying buying lottery tickets when she could ill afford to. So that that's the background to this poem. Lucky dip for Sedna. Your father cut off your fingers as you clung to the kayak and the freezing waters skirted your waist. You sank to the ocean floor and your fingers became seals, walruses and whales. You grew a fishtail and ruled the deep. Now at the counter wearing blue gloves, you have chosen lucky dip. My finger and thumb shape an L that touches the tip of my nose before picking something from the air and Carolina signs Wednesday or Saturday. And you will dive in on Saturday, cling to the hope of fair winds, swish a fishtail skirt if you win. The violence of life swept away, a cruise taking in seals, walruses and whales. Cross fingers, wish you good luck. I think in any collection, there's a poem that is key to what you're trying to do with shaping it. And this one, I was really, really um, grateful that Joe Clements, um, one of the editors of the fantastic magazine, um, Butcher's Dog, published this poem, I, uh, because for me, it was the, it's the key linking poem, and you'll, you'll see why. If my deaf ear were a mushroom, it would not be a jelly ear only seen in winter and spring, growing on hardwood, mainly dead elder trees, will be seen all year round, poking out from straggly grass. Would not be a flea's ear, small with a dirty orange upper surface and a tiny stem that becomes increasingly wrinkled with age. It would grow with age and under stress, flame red. Would not be a toad's ear found on a forest trail, blending in with bark chippings, split down the shorter side. It would be found on a silent path, overlooked, split between worlds. It would not be a hare's ear, yellow with a pinkish tinge, gathered in small groups in woods, most often with beech trees. It would be solitary within an urban environment. It would not be a veined ear, funnel shaped on soil and debris, edibility unknown and with conservation action needed. It would be delectable and mistaken for more common species. It would not be a moss ear, growing on living trees facing downwards, nestled in moss, fingernail width and delicate. It would face outwards, finely balanced, attuned to life's vibrations. It would not be a silver ear, commercially cultivated for cuisine, cures and cosmetics, tasteless but valued for its gelatinous texture. It would be valued for signing the way to alternate reality. So thinking more about fungi and deafness, I think you can roughly divide cultures and people into mycophobes and mycophiles. I would suggest that the British culture is mycophobic. I read a Simon Armitage poem that starts with I kicked a mushroom and then I felt bad. Um, I, I don't, I think that it's to, to do with the otherness of mushrooms and fungi, that their, their secret uh, life, and I mean that the, the actual mushroom is only the fruiting body, of, of the fungi, the mycorrhizal network is, is, is what's connecting everything below the soil. Um, and I wanted to explore that idea about not accepting what we can't immediately understand. Mushroom stones. The sculptures were thought to be phallic symbols only, a theory that still crops up occasionally, but that must be rejected as one-sidedly male-centred, drugtimes.org. And some believed they were idols, and some believed potter's tools, and some believed they were markers, and some believed they were stools, and some believed the cap was female, and some believed the cap should be licked, 
And some believed the stem was male. And some believed the stem should be kicked. And some believed in ancient cultures. And some believed in cults. And some believed in counterculture. And some believed in guilt. And some believed in microphobes. And some believed in microphiles. And some believed in psychedelic strobes. And some believed in a cat that smiles. So I was reading a poet, um, po <laughs> poetry on mine. I was reading a book. I do actually read books sometimes called Finding the Mother Tree. Um, and I've got it here, Suzanne Simard. A very good book, recommend it. But she's actually, she does eat dirt and she discovered the connection between um, the importance of certain fungi and the um, growth of trees and that and she she through that those discoveries she, she was like working in Canada she had a very good argument against sort of um, monocultures of trees and we all know that today I think we're much more aware how wrong that is for example with like you know palm oil just growing one thing um, and so I was thinking about that I was also thinking about the oppression of people who have signed how um, some of my teachers have told me that that they were you know punished for um for signing and my favorite play is the tempest i acted in it many years ago i was aerial but arguably i'd say that caliban is the most interesting character he has all the best lines the most beautiful poetry but of course he had the island um stolen from him by prospero the magician and this this quote made me think of all these how these ideas about language and what we're allowed to um how we're allowed to communicate um, and how we're oppressed for all the dirt eaters the red plague rid you for learning me your language caliban the tempest for all the dirt eaters who have tasted earth Put soil in their mouths to save a root rot how the leaves fell the fungi translated dead matter into minerals for all the dirt eaters who have buried their faces in loam craig clay crunched chalk inhaled deeply for a scent of moss worms mustiness petrichor for all the dirt eaters my sisters my brothers my others who understand that a tap root must go to such depths that my causal fungal networks swap sugar for nutrients for all the dirt eaters who have taken they know not what into their gut whose gut instinct is survival who have been forced to spit sullied words had their mouths molded into shapes they did not desire for all the dirt eaters whose tongues have circled stomata for transpiration, for oxygen, for water, sense them open and close, whose hands have been tied to a bed frame for opening and closing, for framing a sign. For all the dirt eaters who have been locked in a coal bunker until their mouths are clean. For all the dirt eaters who have lifted their hand, palm to face in shame, then licked along each crease, the heart line, the headline, the lifeline, and clung on. For all the dirt eaters who have clawed their cheeks with index and middle fingers, who know this sign for shit is the truth of shame, who have seen it for a sham, who have been cheated of their land, their culture, who have been taught language and their profit is they know how to curse. For all the dirt eaters who will not be styed in a hard rock, who know the hum of twangling instruments about ears is the hum of humanity, the hum of hummus, the hum of exhumed, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, dirt to dirt. For all the dirt eaters who, with their long nails, keep digging for pig nuts. This next poem was a moment of serendipity in lockdown, and um, I don't think it needs any more explanation than that. Six ways mushrooms can save the world. Paul Stamets, mycologist. I'm in love with the old growth forest. The screen has frozen on the TED talk, the static caption, a guru's gift. 
I watched the spinning wheel icon, the endless O like a dog chasing its tail or a ferret in a ring, then run out of similes. Dusty, I caught her name before stasis, holds a green basket with the red stripe and is looking down at the forest floor. Maybe I'll watch the wheels spin forever. The moss covered trunks, the meditative Dusty, whose beautiful dark hair hangs loosely. She looks like she is going on a picnic in the old gross forest, mycelium beneath her feet, feeding those huge furs. The mycologist might be a magician who has vanished. In 100 years, who will wake and say, I'm in love with the old gross forest? When I was growing up, my father used to take me for a walk every weekend in, in Buckinghamshire. And it was kind of like a really lovely ritual. And this is perhaps, well, it is an elegy to him. Um, but also a few years ago, I saw a production of Lady Windermere's Fan with uh, yeah, Jennifer Saunders. And what really interested me was the program had all these little pictures of um, these drawings, beautiful drawings of, of sign language with fans and where you hold them to sort of communicate. And I, I expect probably with a lover and reflecting um, the oppression of, of women during the Victorian times. And I thought that's really interesting, uh, that idea that there are so many languages beyond just speech. Have you seen a tree fall? I saw a tree fall in a wood once, as in once upon a time, as in once. I was young and with my father in the wood, the wood where we walked most Sundays. All those walks falling into each other, all those Sundays through beach and oak and down the side of the old quarry up to the ridge, the same Sunday walk, the comfort of ritual, but this one standout moment separated from all the others that closed like a fan into a stiff held memory of a Sunday walk to be considered. That tree, like a closed ebony fan, was dark and hard and to be considered because the tree became a symbol with its own secret language that could upbraid me for my semiotic ignorance, that could wrap me on the head if I didn't spot the hole, the missing sticks, the deep crack, the way leaf was lost from the outside in. But I was young. I understood none of this. I stood and watched the tree fan out and fall, take up all the space in the wood. For one rushing moment, sweeping away sky, sweeping away the figure of my father, sweeping every Sunday walk into once upon a time, the way a fan drawn across eyes means I'm sorry, and place behind the head means, don't forget me. Again, the date is obviously extremely significant. I was thinking about how we look for signs when there is tragedy, we want something to make sense, and often it just doesn't. How? Bressian, Brittany, the 11th of September, 2021. They told me they found two owls, two dead owls, and they supposed the owls must have flown down the chimney and the owls had no way of knowing how to fly back up the chimney into the night sky. They died a desiccated death, and they told me if I'd seen the owls, I would have cried. The owls were barn owls beautiful and the extraordinary thing was the weight of the owls, incredibly and unexpectedly light. They put the owls in a bin bag because owls are a protected species and this is what the town hall said must be done and to drop off the owls at the town hall. I wanted to know more about the owls and asked if they die together, but no. One owl died at one end of the loft and the other owl 
not especially nearby. And I just want to thank everybody for watching and for listening. Um, and this is my, my final poem before I join Jason um, for the discussion. It, it's probably too much of an explanation for a short poem, but just to say that it does play with my particular um, uh, form of deafness where I often mishear things, but that can be very generative creatively. From Heron. From here on, I'm acknowledging that not every sign is an envoy from a kinder God with a colloquial ascent. The heron in flight over the lake is just a badly crafted idea of a paper aeroplane. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, enjoyed listening to those poems so much. Uh, I hope you've not. Right. Okay. I thought you had frozen a bit. Uh, that so much, and uh, so so many people are saying in the chat how much they've enjoyed your beautiful and um, stimulating poetry. Um, and I, I can't remember if, I, if I've actually said this to you, uh, but I'm saying it now face to face. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I think, you know, publishing a second book is a, a special kind of big deal. Um, I will probably get a chance to talk about that, that experience. In <laughs> <laughs> It's all about you Jason's tonight. second book. It's which all is about brilliant. you tonight, Lisa. Um, <laughs> you know, I was just so, you know, I I, I love reading poems on first uh, reading, and I've enjoyed spending time with the book again. And you know, I obviously have uh, some questions about um, a, a lot of questions, also based on. Um, hearing your reading tonight, but I'll I'll just try to contain myself. Um, uh, I suppose you know, given that you've you've talked about um, uh, quoting you in in what you've said just now, so many languages beyond just speech. My first question is is about um, the first section of your book, Chamber. Of from which you've read so many poems tonight. Several of the poems deal directly with sign language and as I see it, uh, with the relationship between sign language, space, the body. Uh, I feel that here sign language comes across as a different way of almost of thinking of space, of orienting oneself in space. And um, your 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 ultimate interest seems to be in asking us what it is to claim to be able to speak. The poems are asking us to think about language as physical as felt. It's a long preamble to just ask you to talk about do you see yourself, do you sorry, do you see your poetry rather as as your attempt? to take us into your physical experience of language? Mm. Thank you, Jason. That's, that's the question. Yeah, the physical experience of language. Um, I think we all experience language physically to a, a lesser or greater degree. I mean, I'm, I'm conscious certain cultures are much more expressive. Um, from my own personal experience with my single-sided deafness, physicality is very important for me in terms of how I orientate, you use the word orientation, which is really interesting. It's very important to British Sign Language, handshake, orientation, um, location, 
non-manual features. Caroline will tell me off if I don't get them all. But, um, you know, this, this is in completely important where you are in space. And, um, yeah, for me, I mean, before I started learning British Sign Language even, my hearing ear, I have to, you know, you know turn it to the speaker. Um, so it means that I'm very particular where I am in a, in a, a room. Um, in a crowded space where I ignore somebody who comes up flush on my on my left side. So it's always been quite limiting for me, um, unless I'm speaking to a big crowd. I mean, I was an actress many years ago, because you know where you are, you're orientated on stage, you've learned your lines, you've learned your cues, you know exactly where the audience is, you know where the, your, your fellow actors are going to, to turn up. You've done all that in rehearsal. But you know the, I, the the playground, for example, with a lot of noise and um, um, children shouting and screaming. I can't orientate where sounds come from. That meant that I I preferred sort of one to ones. I, I was often quite solitary. I probably where my love of reading came from. I sort of absent myself from situations like that. So the physical space and who is going to be in it is really important to me. I found that sign language, although I said, you know, I've got a long way to learn, it's very freeing. You, you, you feel, mm -hmm. you know, the space becomes another dimension that is so much you're attached to in the, with the body um, and, you know, your expressions. It's, it's, I mean, if you look at, maybe it's changing now, but it used to be, the, you know, in, the, in society, I think, and having spoken to people um, who will, you know, tell you off for waving your arms around or or being too expressive. Um, it seems to be that the, the higher up you are in the culture and, you know, in the hierarchy and with the class system, the less expressive you are. I mean, you look at news readers as well. I mean, that's partly, I'm going into something else now because that's partly they can't be seen to be expressing um, if they're, they're, you know, giving all, all, uh, tragic stories. But, but um Yes, it's freeing and also space is used in sign language. There, are, you know, you have two types of space. You have something called syntactic space, which um, is an actual space. So say I put my, if I was talking about somebody, say my sister and I put them there and then I could direct, at, they would be there. They're not really there, but um, you probably don't need a lesson in British Sign Language, but but then topographical space is like a map. So if I say um, the church is opposite the supermarket, it's that's that's much more like a map. You know, you can be wrong if you, if you if you get the spacing wrong. You've got if you put them in the wrong place, then you're, you're not giving an, a, an accurate. Um, example of the map and you could confuse people. So space is so important and, and that's all in British Sign Language in the, ling, you know, in the linguistics that you learn. It's a very complex language. Um, and there are things in the, the deaf culture. So it's okay to, if you, if you want to get somebody's attention, you, you, know, you can tap people on the shoulder or you can stamp your foot for the vibrations. You know, space is used differently. Whereas in the hearing world, that might be considered rude. So, Yes, space is very important to me and yeah. my, my experience yeah. of that and how I put that yeah. across in poems. Yeah, uh, um, absolutely. And, uh, I guess that is in with uh, the conversation discussion we have with respect to how we communicate or what is uh, or what are good ways or the right ways of, of communicating. And those sort of the different ways of speaking and communicating that get invis that become invisible or invisibilized, if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So that I suppose, you know, it also ties into, I think what's the, the big thing here that I think I and many other people would want to hear you talk about, which is the link between the fungi and, you know, fungi, and deafness and where that's leading you mm -hmm. in terms of the thinking process and the po and your poetics at the moment. Um, I've got in my book, A Golden Shovel. Mm -hmm. 
the I remember that one <laughs> invented by Terence Hayes in um, respect to Gwendolyn Brooks and Merlin Shell Drake's book in Tangled Life. I, I was starting writing about fungi and deafness, but then I came across this book and I thought, wow, because there was one phrase in there, or, um, and I'll read it because I won't remember it all. And it, it's the, it's the um, phrase that I use for the golden shovel, which I think is pretty key. Mm -hmm. Might we be able to expand some of our concepts, such as speaking might not always require ears and interpreting might not always require a nervous system. Are we able to do this without smothering other life forms with prejudice and innuendo? And that's so pertinent to the deaf culture. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I don't believe he was writing that with any awareness of deaf culture, but if you, if you do any sort of even preliminary um, investigations into fungi, as we're talking about the sort of the networks, you'll, and you'll quickly realize how vital they are for um, communicating with the wood wide web, swapping um, because they can't photosynthesize like us. I mean, I think we have a lot in common. I think we uh, uh, you know, share 50% of our DNA with fungi. That there's that communication at that sort of sub level, that sub layer that is so vital for the health of, you know, the old growth forest, for the health of the woods, for the health of the planet, is absolutely um, essential. And I and the way they communicate um, and the way that um, hyphae will sort of explore, and if they find a, a territory that is hostile to them, withdraw and, and and try somewhere else. That sort of horizontal way of communication. That I find really interesting. It feels more like a collaboration, um, and you know, rather than sort of this idea of hierar hierarchy and and communicating, just being, this is what you are going to learn, and the teachers at the front, and you all sit there with your pens and papers and write things down, and there's just one source of truth. I think that's what I find fungi so fascinating, and also because of the myriad ways that they. Um, can use not just communication, but what they can be used for. I just, they're, I mean, they're, they're endlessly fascinating. I mean, if you if you take psychedelic edibles, that's another way we're going, you know, the, the communication goes to another whole different, different layer. I mean, I'm not suggesting that anybody, anybody, anybody should do that, but, you know, you know why did they want to, you know, why did they develop like that? Probably to, to attract, animals, reindeer, apparently, there's the whole idea of, um, you know, flying reindeer, reindeer like them, like um, um, fly agaric. Um, and, you know, maybe that was a way of, you know, spreading their spores. So, I mean, how, how clever is that to offer something so addictive and wonderful to, to you know, spread mm -hmm. yourself and to, to communicate with other life forms? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and um, uh, I, you know, it, it, the, the, the poetry, so, so many of them made me think about those, alter, those other ways of communicating, whether those are ways that we ourselves have or ways that we don't have, but ways that other species have like the fungi. And that force us to sort of, I think, lead us to think about uh, other forms of communication and the, the sort of entangled life, you know, to use a word, <laughs> you know, that's very, very um, relevant at the moment, the sort of entangled entanglements that we're a part of as, you know, in the living world. But, but uh, you know, what I really treasure about the book as a whole is the way it's made me stop and question our oral centricity, which obviously you've mentioned already. Um, uh, the question for me is, as I'll just, say you know just go straight into the question which is what does poetry become when we refuse to center the oral mm -hmm. that, that's what i'd like you to speak about what, what does poetry become when we refuse when we refuse to center the oral mm. that is a huge a huge question i i've got friends um very good poets who believe that poetry is all about the oral 
and it, I am interested. I mean, as being half deaf, I have to listen really hard. And so wordplay and where things, where there are eruptions and ruptures, that's what interests me, will often sort of feed a new poem a mishearing or, okay, what, why did I, you know, it will, it, like I said, it, it's, 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 it's generative, but I am very interested in um, um, concrete poetry. The, the poetry, the look of it on the page is, is important to me. I, I find it, um, aesthetically displeasing <laughs> if if I feel oh okay this is a great poem but it hasn't quite found its form um I was very interested in Philip Terry's book the uh, Lasco notebooks um that we launched with Carcanet with all with and how he had interpreted the the cave the drawings and what they, that might mean and I I wondered even then perhaps they were using sign language back then who knows that it was you know it's an assumption that that this communication or, or the, these drawings were, were spoken, what, but not necessarily so. So um, I, I'm not saying at all that there's, you know, I, I'm the, not room for both, but I, I would like to see more sort of um, understanding of poetry that it does, doesn't just rely on the oral. I'm not saying just, I mean, there's lots of um, arguments, aren't there, and uh, between the stage and the page and the spoken word and the written word. So there's there's always these discussions, which I think can be very, very fruitful. But if you look at British Sign Language poets, and I suggest that anybody who's watching, who's interested, can go and look them up online. You know, Zoe McQuinney, um, she's a fantastic poet who, who works in the sort of visual vernacular, which is it's sort of mime, dance, sign language. There's no speech there. Um, and D.L. Williams, Sophie Stone, you know, these are poets who aren't using necessarily, I mean, and D.L. Williams will work in both in, in, in English and sign language, but th th there's kind of a spectrum and it's how far you want to yeah. centre yeah. yourself. And I don't think just because you're, you know, if here's oral and, and here's sign or concrete poetry, it doesn't, it, one doesn't invalidate the other. Where, and where you place yourself mm -hmm. might, might change. I mean, you know, you can, you can, you can vary it. Um, there's, there's a slide rule there, well, not a rule, but the, 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 there's the option, the choice, choice. Yeah. how much you want to explore. And I would, I mean, in the future, personally, I would like to explore sign language poetry, BSL poetry, I'd like to, to, get better, I'm not, I mean, started it, shall I say, not get better at it, started it even. Um. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I mean, that, that answer to me is interesting. And also to, to hear the names of poets who are doing sort of different modes of communication with the body beyond just um, spoken language as, as it were, or articulate language and, you know, just reflect, just, Thinking of, you know, after asking my question, I, 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 I almost felt I wanted to qualify it. You know, I know that there's been a lot of a, a lot of sidelining of orality in, in poetry as well. So that's been <laughs> a thing and that many yeah. people listening might, might be going there in, in terms of thinking, uh, you know, pre there's precisely been a sidelining of orality in the history of, you know, yeah. um, um, the benefit of the written word, a sort of hierarchy where the written is 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 privileged over over the oral but i guess you know i asked the question um and, and i think you know this thinking about um um you know it, it it's more than than just that that sort of dichotomy it's a, so the way your poetry is opening up another discussion around ableism obviously but more broadly around the ecological violence um around ecological violence in terms of humankind's beliefs about who and what can speak uh, and, and that sort of thing. So perhaps a, a, a better, more suitable word there is fluency, which mm -hmm. takes me back to your first book, which is a map to, to fluency. So I think that there's a, a sort of red thread there uh, connecting the two works. And I, I, I suppose I'd like you to talk about that red thread 
uh, and it's an opportunity also to talk about process and how you've come to, you know, the, the, the experience of putting together a second collection. If you could just talk about those things um, for us, please. Mm -hmm. the, the first collection, I think, for like many, many poets, um, with poems oh, and, and if, if i if i if i uh, i won't interrupt you for, for long but i need i need i really need to um remind people that if they've got questions if if they could put them in the q a and i'll be feeding those to to lisa just after this mm. just after this sorry sorry lisa please no that's fine i think the, the first collection was um a way of perhaps ordering poems that i didn't necessarily know what I wanted them to be until I started putting the book together and I used the idea of um, what a, the, the pro, a map, what you need in, in a map. And that, and that was the way I, I sectioned it. I did think then about the different languages that were a loss to me. I mentioned Danish. I had an intention to learn Danish and quickly gave that up because if you go to Denmark, they all speak English so fluently. Um, and then, that idea of fluency and hoping for things that didn't necessarily come about, partly because of, you know, life, laziness, whatever. The second collection was definitely impacted by uh, lockdown. So the thread there was perhaps learning sign language at a deeper level. You know, my, my first collection, A Map Towards Fluency, is very early days about um, the first lessons that I had and 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 um, just the very basics of sign language but the, the the house of the interpreter is thinking more about oralism more about I mean as you learn any language you learn about its culture and learning about the oppression of British sign language and this was going on at the same time as lockdown was happening so I was on my own I had a lot of time to um, sort of process and then the idea of the mushrooms, I was going on the same walk every day around a nature reserve, looking out for fungi, um, making those connections. And, and like a lot of people, a lot of poets, a lot of great poetry, I think, has come out of lockdown, which with a focus on, on the planet, with the environment, we were much quieter, there were less planes, there was less noise. Um, also, at the same time, there was this awful pandemic, people dying, you know, it's a very confusing disorientating time but for some people it was a quieter time and a time for reflection so I think that reflective quality has come through more in the, in in the second book and as I said earlier on that idea of how we communicate what is life like if we are just going to impose a monoculture what is life like if we're going to impose one way of speaking one language the English language and not think about other ways I mean we had the um, BSL Act that was passed last March, which, thank God, you know, um, which recognises British Sign Language. We had all the problems with not uh, supplying interpreters during the pandemic when the, the British government didn't give out information with interpreters. They said captions was enough. Well, if English isn't your first language and reading English isn't your, you know, it's not going to make necessarily a lot of sense to you. So, you know, for the deaf community, that was exceptionally um, um, exclusive, you know, just to right. exclude them. So, so I was thinking of all these things, and I think that's come through in the book more, that sort of deeper political resonance, the deeper where I fit in with my deafness. I mean, I'm, obviously, I've had all the privileges of the hearing world in many respects, um, but then where do I fit in with deaf culture? Where, where, what is my right to be a, a communication support worker? I mean, I've stepped back from doing anything like that now um, after reflection, but th th these, they, I don't have any definite answers. The House of the yeah. Interpreter is- but that, but, uh, but that, that's, that's all a bit, I mean, I, uh, thank you so much for um, um, uh, answering my, 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 my questions though, for, for engaging with them. I, 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 I do appreciate that, Lisa. I'm aware that we're pressed for time. So I've opened the Q&A here and I've got a, a fascinating question from Nika Zundel. I hope I've pronounced that last name correctly. Who's asking, do fungi have something to teach us about the nature of poetry and perhaps its difference from prose? Don't you love that question? That's such a fantastic question. <laughs> I 
think for me, fungi, what do they teach me about poetry? I, mean, I love research. I love, I love thinking outside just my own emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, a poem can often come from, I like to use a, a, a lens um, or a different way of thinking about something that troubles me or um, an issue. And for, for me, fungi, the way they have so many different properties and, and the way they're quite secret and connect, I hope that the poems in the book don't center me, mm. you know, that lyrical eye, um, as much as I feel that they, I, they can or have, it has done in, in perhaps other poetry. It's probably made me sort of, re, you know, the tentacles, the tendrils, um, the hyphae, the networks. I want to be more part of that network. And I think poetry is moving in many ways towards that collaboration and networking, that sort of horizontal and working with other art forms as well. So I think that is something that fungi can teach us. That's a fantastic question. Um, and yeah, like prose, I mean, it's finding forms and different ways of being and the way of being and the way of poetry that suits you and what you want to achieve rather than being in the school of whoever has mm -hmm. claimed the latest school of thought for what poetry should be. I think it allows you a lot of um, opportunities, freedom, and room to communicate in ways that you think make sense to you. And if it, and if other people like it, they probably will. Um, and then they can they can find you and they can work with you and collaborate, and we can have great discussions like this. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. Such an interesting answer, and I know that there is so much to say. I mean, there's so many questions coming through, um, stimulated by your poems. Um, and thanks, thanks for people who are who are saying things in the in the chat. We'll 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 be careful to save those. I've just got a second and I think final question, unfortunately, um, for you before we ask you, um, Lisa, to read a final poem for us. And it's from Fred Degar. Hello, Fred, um, who asks, in, in, he says in your very informative blog about the collection that you wrote for the you, you break down parts of the air the exception of sound before it makes sense and then how it makes sense is your collection a poetry translation of this process that's a, that's an interesting question as well Sorry, Jason, you, you got... cut out a bit there, so I couldn't hear you. I'll just say, so it says that in the in the in the blog you, you did for the website, yeah. you break down the parts of the ear to illustrate the physical reception of sound before it makes sense, and then how it makes sense. So Fred is asking if your collection is a translation, is a poet poetry translation of this process. Yeah, I mean, certainly some of the poems in the first section that you mentioned, the Michelangelo one. Um, and learning British Sign Language on the on the um, on the running machine, I think about how the signs are that the sort of the the, um, the the structure of British Sign Language, and then what I was trying to learn, and then that came first, and then that is what that suggested to me in terms of emotions. So it, that was a translation in a way of how I was receiving sign language, how I was processing it, because I was learning at the same time. And then the impact that had physically and emotionally on me and trying to put that into the, into the poem. So there was definitely a translation going on because it's not, it's not natural. I'm not fluent in sign language at all. So when I'm learning sign language or new signs or thinking about hand shapes, for example, in call an airborne loved one, what does that actually mean when I'm connecting that with the emotions? I mean, you could argue that that poem, I didn't set out to write a poem about an air crash, for example. Um, and, and, but that definitely came through and I can't remember what else was going on around me at the time um, in terms of the news, but the two, 
they're not natural they're not natural um bed partners but they i try and, and so to some extent that kind of process and that linking you could argue that it is forced but that that is something that i like to work with you know the, the different structure how structure of sign language and what i'm learning mm -hmm. impacts on me emotionally and then how i'm going to express that in english in a, in a, in a, a written in a written way i mean there's lots of strands mm -hmm. there that go together so but that that process is quite entangled I would, um, and difficult for me even to sort of pick out each strand and what came first uh, yeah uh, uh, fascinating um uh, can I ask you a final question for a five second? Can we do a five second? I'll reply? give you a five second is answer. That, is that okay? <laughs> Lisa, are you there? Or am yes. I still here? Um, just, this is one from Caroline Palm, Caroline Palmer. What's your favorite poem from the book? My favorite poem from the book? Five seconds. Um. I, Your favorite poem from the book? Oh gosh, I I think it's the Golden Shovel. Ah, uh, I, I, I yes, that's a that's a good one. Uh, well, um, thank you so much for this moment, Lisa. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed it, um, and I'm just going to ask you to to close this out with a final poem. Thanks so much, and congrats again. Um, and savor the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Those amazing questions. A valid excuse. It was a beautiful day, I will tell them. I felt myself flowering towards the feminine. The mechanical digger dealing in dirt was a distraction from the girl on her bike in the rainbow dress and a helmet with a pink unicorn horn. Any beauty will be lost in the retelling, I will tell them. I envied the cat basking in beauty and the pregnant model in an orange leopard skin bikini lying on the grass. One living in the present, the other expectant. Why pick up pen and paper on a day like this, I will ask. I will tell them and they will understand. It was a beautiful day. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love that poem. I'm so glad you closed with that poem. Um, it was beautiful to hear you read from the book. So thank you and congratulations, Lisa. And thank you so much for hosting Jason um, and for the great conversation. And thank you guys for your uh, input to the conversation. It was great to see the chat so lively um, and for your brilliant questions as well. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to them all. Uh, please go and buy your copy of the book. Um, we appreciate you paying your two pounds to be here. The link is in the chat for you now. It's got the discount code there. It'll come as an email tomorrow as well. So if you have any trouble getting hold of a discounted copy of the book, get in touch with us and we'll do our best to help you with that. Um, and the final thing for me to say is please join us again next time. Um, next week we're launching Kit Fan's third collection. It's his first collection with Carcanet Press, so that's an exciting one for us. Um, details are in the chat and everything on the website, so um, go and check it out and subscribe to our newsletter so you know what's going on. So that's everything. Um, well done again, Lisa, and thank you very, very much.